Welcome and nice lot of smiley, friendly faces, which is, which is good to see. My name is Bernie Wales. I, I come from the world of property management, leaseholds, etc. I've been in property management since 1984. I think, well, that's when I started my first company, anyway. Um, and over the years, I've been a leaseholder, a company secretary, resident freehold director, landlord, a bit across the board, really. So, um, what you might call GP of leasehold, I suppose, um, as opposed to these two here who are more like consultants and brain surgeons, I would say. <laughs> Maxine, we've got here who. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. My name's Maxine. Give it five minutes. Won't you? <laughs> <laughs> he knows I can speak for England. Uh, my name's Maxine for the Gill, and um, I work in the world of block management so I'm a block managing agent um, but also I am a landlord myself and I have a number of leasehold properties um, and for my sins I'm also a independent councillor on Seven Oaks <laughs> so uh, non-political so to speak um, and the other thing that I'm doing at the moment is that uh, I'm the president of Arla Property Mark so I represent the side for landlords um, on the uh, on, on landlord side, so uh, and obviously agents as well. Busy girl, we're lucky to have you here today on your fleeting world tours that you're doing all at the minute. <laughs> and Mark, you're, well, in my eyes, the leasehold brain surgeon. You get to the nitty gritty <laughs> of hands on and, yeah. and stuff. Far too complimentary. My name's Mark Chick, I'm a senior partner of Bishop and Sewell, Central London Law Firm. I'm also director and chairman of something called ALEP, that's the Association of Leasehold and Franchisement Practitioners. Uh, I write regularly and broadcast on leasehold issues, so I'm happy to join this panel today just to give Bernie and the others just to talk about some of the things that are coming up in leasehold reform. We cannot hear the Bernie, if you can speak up. Okay, we'll try and speak up a little bit more, sorry. The, the air conditioning is a bit loud, so the least. If anyone's good at turning things off, go, please turn that off. Um, we're here to talk about leasehold reform, which has been on the cards for a long, or in fact, the whole of my property management life has been leasehold reform is coming along. Um, various little bits have come along, but the government certainly have um, put it on the agenda in recent years. Um, but we don't have anything clear cut and in good timetable for it at the minute. But we'll try and take you through some of the things that uh, have happened and are proposed to be happening. The first one we have actually got was the Leasehold Reform Brackets Ground Rents Close Brackets Act 2022, uh, which came in recently. Um, and Mark, we, we had some news on that yep, today. Absolutely. So I don't know if you've been looking at your social media, but I did put a tweet out last night. I received a letter from Lord Greenhalgh telling us that the Leasehold Reform Ground Rent Act 2022 will come into force on the 30th of June this year. That's an act that will ban ground rents for new leases and means that all brand new leases, so new leases of flats and houses, won't be able to have a ground rent anymore. I take it we're all clear about what a ground rent is. That's a nominal sum of money, normally £100, £200 is payable to the freeholder as part of the privilege of owning the property. Uh, the problem has been over recent years, as some of you may have followed the so-called leasehold scandal, we've had landlords charging exorbitant ground rents or putting in clauses where ground rents double over time. So for those of you that invest in property, if you're looking at a property and it's a leasehold property, I will say two things, obviously read the lease, but then also look at the ground rent. Now, this leasehold reform ground rent bill will mean that there can be no ground rent in new leases, but it doesn't mean that there'll be no ground rent in existing leases. So existing leases are unaffected by this change. Um, the other thing to say is that people often vary leases by agreeing something with their freeholder. They want to extend the lease. There are two main ways you can do that. One under a statute called the Leasehold Reform Housing and Urban Development Act 1993. That adds on 90 years and gives you a lease extension with zero ground rent. There's no more ground rent to pay on one of those extensions. The other way of doing it is by a voluntary agreement with the freeholder. And it's those sorts of arrangements which sometimes have caused issues in the past. So if the ground rent is escalating at a rate which exceeds inflation, that can cause a significant problem for you as a property owner. If the ground rent exceeds 0.1% of the capital value of the property, then that will be seen as being an onerous ground rent and the property will probably become very difficult to sell or remortgage. So the good news about this act is it means that ground rent is restricted for new leases with effect from the 30th of June. 
And if you do a voluntary deal, the landlord will only be able to impose the existing ground rent. So if you're currently paying £250 a year for the next 60 or 70 years, that can continue. And if you add more time onto the end of the lease, if you add another 50 years on, that new 50-year term, albeit 70 years down the track, will be at a zero ground rent. There will be no more ground rent to pay. So that's, in a nutshell, what the Leasehold Reform Ground Rent Act or, uh, will envisage. And it'll be a big sweeping change. There are some very, very limited exemptions. Some of you might own freeholds and you might say, how can I get around this act? Well, the short answer is you can't. Uh, it is basically what it is. It does what it says on the tin. It bans ground rent. There are a couple of small exemptions. Have a look at our website. You can see some articles I've written about it there. Um, you can see bishopandsewell.co.uk or my, my, my blog, which is leaseholdreformnews.com. Um, but you're going to find that basically for new leases, there will be no more ground rent. And we're going to see a phase shift as ground rent becomes less popular. And that may also have another impact on the market because people will then say, well, look, this lease does have a ground rent. This one doesn't have a ground rent. Which one do I prefer? And it may well be people will prefer the lease that doesn't have the ground rent. So there we are. That's a nutshell on the... So everyone here is panicking, that. thinking, right, I must go home and read my lease and maybe do <laughs> a lease extension. Um, in reality, if they instruct you tomorrow, you're not going to get that done by 30th of June, are you? So I don't think that's necessarily a concern. If you wanted to get rid of the ground under your lease, you'd be best advised to carry out a statutory claim. And when you serve the notice claiming that statutory lease extension, that's when time stops ticking on the lease itself. So if we're talking about lease extensions generally, one thing I would pass on to investors is the idea that you must be clear about how long the lease is, because if the lease slips under 80 years, there's a big watch point, because you'll start paying something called marriage value, which will greatly increase the amount you would pay. So I think to answer Bernie's question, if, you, if you've got a lease you are concerned about and you want to take action, the statutory route is quite a good way forward, because it means that you can peg things as they are. If you serve the notice today, and the lease drops under 80 years tomorrow, it's as if time has stopped running. So you've got the, your valuation position preserved as at the date of service of the Section 42 notice. Um, for people who've got onerous ground rents in their leases already, they've got a problem because they're finding that you know, perhaps the ground rent reviews by reference to capital value of the property, or the ground rent reviews are accelerating. So what's normal is a 25-year interval, because 25 years is generally seen as being the point in time at which uh, through inflation, things will have doubled on a sort of compounded 8% per annum rate. Um, and the market generally tolerates that. If the ground rent rises at 10 or 15 year intervals, by reference to something which might be a compounded doubler, or a mechanism that says we take the existing number and multiply it by something, that is not good news. If it's referred to the retail price index, that's probably more tolerable. But nonetheless, people are becoming less tolerant of frequent ground rent reviews and leases. So the way forward there, once again, people say, why do I need a lease extension? Because my lease is very, very long indeed. It's 250 years long. Well, actually, you probably still do, because if you want to get rid of the ground rent, that's the only way forward. You add on the extra 90 years, a bit mad because you made the lease uh, you know, 90 years on top of the 250, so you've got a 340-year lease now. But it's at a zero rent, and that solves the problem. So. Mm -hmm. That is the advice I'd give for people who've got significant concerns in that direction. So, Maxine, you're in block management. Um, are you seeing leaseholders coming to you saying, should I extend, should I wait for these leasehold reforms that are going to be better for us all? Yes, what, I am. What's your take? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Bernie, because I am. Um, I had uh, somebody contacting me um, only this week, and they've had a number of properties. The years have all gone below 80 years. Um, they've been hearing on the grapevine like people do. Oh, what, you know, the, these, all these changes are coming about and they're hearing about, um, you know, all the reforms. And so he said to me, I've not bothered to actually extend any of my leases at this point in time because there's all these changes coming about. Now, it, it's not actually true. The changes that are coming about are only on new leases. So the, the worry here is if you leave it, and this guy has, and it's now got to the stage where many of them are actually now gone into the marriage value, which is below the 80 years, it's gonna start costing. Um, and so, uh, and this doesn't change, does it, Mark? So, you know, we, we've mm. got a bit of a position here. So my advice to him was, 
don't wait and get it done straight away. And I actually said to him and phoned Mark, <laughs> and hopefully he did. Yeah, well, I think, could, could I just come in on that, Bernie? Is yeah, that all right? Because yeah. I think the thing to bear in mind there, so the, when we talk about reform, we've just talked about the Lease on Reform Ground Rent Act. That is something the government is committed to do, and they're committed to doing it back in December 2017. Sajid Javid said two things. He said we would mm. ban the creation of ground rent for new leases, and they would stop the use of leases for leasehold houses where that wasn't necessary, mm. because that was the ills of the so-called leasehold scandal. A lot of these leases with escalating ground rents were in the north uh, northwest of the country, and they were they were houses. And the question there was no real reason why they should have been sold as on leases, but for the fact that the developer wanted to keep a ground rent. So that's one thing. Now. The other thing you promised, so if you think about it in, in terms of time and when things might happen, that's December 2017 to now. Two things, banning the creation of leasehold houses, that hasn't happened yet. Banning ground rent for new leases, that has happened now. So it took five years to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Now, what's perhaps not been said is that there was also very significant discussion with the Law Commission about reforming all of the law in relation to leasehold. That's a much bigger topic, but we are here to talk about leasehold reform after all. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about two things, one of which is common hold, which is a system that doesn't involve leases at all. Common hold is currently on the statute books, but it's not considered to be fit for purpose. So unfortunately, whilst you could go out and buy a common hold flat, you might think, there are only about 18 developments in the country where there are common holds because there are significant issues with it. A government has committed to trying to reform the law in relation to common hold to make it much more acceptable. And they've started something called the Common Hold Council. And the Common Hold Council has met, and it is going to be an industry panel of experts. Maxine will probably have some representatives from the FPRA that are on that and other industry bodies. But they've got the job of telling government what needs to be done to make that happen. And that is something which will take, I would suggest, probably maybe 5, 10, 15 years to get to the point where we can really change all the other bits of law that need to be changed to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that's often talked about in terms of reform. The other one is reforming the law in relation to leasehold more generally, because people say, well, look, we want to abolish leases for residential property. It's not right. It's iniquitous. There's lots of campaigning groups out there who do a lot of good work, the Leasehold Knowledge Partnership and other people who've been very vociferous. And that's led to political movement on this front. So if you're in, in property and looking at the medium to long term horizon, one question you could ask yourself is, will we be seeing so many, you know, will we see common hold in the future? I think maybe we will, one day, not now. What about the other reforms? Well, because of the political groundswell, because of an all party parliamentary group in Parliament that started looking at this probably four or five years ago, when the ills of the leasehold scandal were first best known, we've had a lot of consultation and the Law Commission, which is an independent body, which looks at reforming the law, did a massive body of work. They reported back in July, 20th July 2020 it was, um, and they produced three enormous reports. Go on their website, have a look at them if you're interested. And they looked at all the options for reforming, because government said we want to do two things. We want to make it cheaper and easier, so cheaper and easier for people to buy their freehold or extend their lease. Now that sounds quite simple. But actually the detail to get that done, if you look at the history of the leasehold reform legislation, which stretches right back to 1967, so going back more than 50 years, um, there's lots of bits of legislation all laid on top of each other, lots of valuation things that have all been laid on top of each other. It's quite complicated. So to change that will take quite a lot of tweaking, not just one or two little statutory amendments. And somebody said to me earlier on, they said, oh, can't this just be done by one simple statutory instrument? <laughs> the answer to that is no. So, where are we in terms of that? Well, the Law Commission did these fantastic reports. The government received them. The government said, right, we'll set up the Common Hold Council to look at implementing Common Hold. On the leasehold reform side, so the making it cheaper and easier to extend your lease or buy your freehold side of things, they said, well, look, we'll think about that. The government received the report. Government won't, the Law Commission won't normally do its work unless the government says it's going to take it seriously. So the government has said it will listen to what they've said and consider the options for reform. But at the moment, the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities have got lots and lots of other things on their plate, including the Building Safety Act and other things which we could possibly talk about during this session this afternoon. So that means this is probably not top of their agenda. So the question you've got to ask yourself, and you know, whilst I'm well placed to answer some of these questions, I'm an expert in this area, even I can't say to you, well, you know, someone's prepared a draft bill, the draft bill's got to go to Parliament, it's got to be discussed, it's got to go through Parliament, it's got to make it to the statute books. It's a big, big, big act you'd be, you'd be bringing in. You're bringing a piece of consolidating legislation. So a bit like if you've ever looked at the New Companies Act, it's got about <coughs> a thousand sections in it. It could be something like that. So that's not a small task. So would it take two, three, four, five years for that to come in? I don't know. One thing I could say to you, perhaps, if you want to have a political discussion, is look, 
um, you know, there's an election coming up. Not now, but in May 2024, by May 2024, we'll have to choose a new government. Mm -hmm. And in the run-up to that election, perhaps the government will want to deliver more good news because if you look at leasehold property generally, at one point government didn't have a very good understanding of how many leaseholds there were. They thought there were about maybe three or four million or there was a command paper from the 2002 Act that said there's only maybe a million and a half properties. Well, that's absolute rubbish. There's at least four and a half million leasehold properties. And if they're co-owned, well, there's about eight million votes. So suddenly people have start, started to take up, you know, listen, the you know, politicians' ears are pricked up and they think, OK, maybe we will we'll do something about this. Mm -hmm. And there are 250, or there were 250 odd MPs in the APPG in Parliament as well, all interested in reform in this area because they realised it was going to get them votes. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. and of course, help the needs of their constituents, apologies to any MPs in the audience, but um, so, you know, your guess is as good as mine, Bernie, but I think, you know, it's wrong to say that reforms aren't coming, as to when, it's very hard to say. And so I get asked, you know, if I said I had a pound for every time I asked someone else the question, should I do this now or should I wait? I'd have a big, very big pile of pound coins on the table here in front of me. Um, because each person's individual circumstances are different. It depends if you're going to hold for the longest term possible. If you need to sell or remortgage in the short term, probably, and if you're an investor, you want flexibility, probably the right answer is to take action now. Mm. There we are. And I, I, I do get pennies um, for consultations <laughs> on that subject. And, and every week I get one person who says, shall I do it now? Shall I wait? Will it be better next year, etc." And I always say, well, the law is what it is now. The values are what they are now. Deal with what you've got now, because tomorrow may not come. I think also, Bernie, the problem that we also face is every lease is different yeah. um, and leases are so complicated as well. Um, we are the only country in the world that has this terrible complicated leasehold system. Um, most there are a other of, countries. Singapore's got them, and there are a couple oh, of other jurisdictions. Yeah, there are, there are <laughs> other many. jurisdictions that do yeah, have Not them, many, so, though, not are many. they? No, no, no. no. And I do <laughs> lease reading service as well, so <laughs> where people can't understand. Say, Guantanamo it. Bay was on the lease. One of the things I've point. already seen as a result of the um, the ground rent coming down to zero is a number of freehold sales on brand new developments falling through, um, and renegotiations, etc. Um, now the government did this in, in order to level the playing field with common hold, obviously. Um, are we going to see, I think we are, but I think we're going to see developers um, building new stuff and then handing over that freehold to the resident company, um, to the residents themselves. Because if you've not got a, con a, a, a ground rent income coming in, then the amount of money you can make as a freeholder out of that freehold is fairly limited. But on the liability side, the there's a huge amount of stuff. So do you think that's going to happen? We're going to see a lot more resident freehold companies? Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, Mark had, had said about the common holds um, and, and the new form. Um, and I know Mark and I were both sitting on that round table group um, when they, we, we were, were going through these great big papers on common holds. And there was a lot of appetite for it in the room, but there wasn't a lot of appetite for it, as you can imagine, from the developers. Um, and they were definitely not interested. I think you're absolutely spot on. I think we're going to see far, far more and more companies that are going to be set up as resident management companies um, and they're going to then be handed over. Because what's the point? What is the point for a freeholder to hang on to the asset when there's no value in it anymore, where they used to get the ground rent and then eventually when the years go down to um, you know, below 80 years, then they would actually make a lot of money. If they can't have that anymore, why would they want to hold on to the asset? It's no, no yeah. point. No, I agree. And I think that means that all of you out there and people like you are going to have to get educated in leasehold because you'll end up running your own blocks and then realising that the freeholder wasn't such a bastard after all, it is actually quite a complicated job. Um, but moving on from that, um, you know, one of the <coughs> other things is um, is enfranchisement, etc. Do you do you think we're going to see a change in leaseholders not waiting for things to happen, but? going and taking over their blocks? Well, I, I can speak from personal experience on this one. Um, I've got a <coughs> property that I bought back in 2002 um, and it's only a standard house. It's got, I've got the upstairs masonette and it's over two floors and then downstairs it's a very small flat. Um, and 
I've always had problems with the freeholder. He's not a nice person. <laughs> so over the years, he, he has no idea how to actually issue a ground rent demand, for instance. And so every year he sends it without the rights and obligations. And every year I send it back and say, I'm really sorry, Mr. Landlord, but I'm not paying this until you actually issue it correctly, which of course in law, I'm, I've got the right to do. Well, it's now got to that stage where my years, because I've been fighting with this horrible man, has gone down to 64 years. So it was a little bit of panic, mm. yeah, because it's yep. gone really yep. down and down. I've offered over the years to buy him out, but he always thought he was going to make his millions. This man's now in his late 80s, and he was a former estate agent, and he's absolutely fucking mad. <laughs> um, so he's always thought he's going to make loads of money like, like, like landlords or like freeholders have over many years. So in the end, um, I spoke to the guy downstairs. Unfortunately for him, he bought the property when it was 81 years. He was really, really poorly advised. Nobody told him the consequences. Nobody said that you're going to have to own it for two years. Nobody gave him the, 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 literally what he should have been given through the conveyancing, through the estate agents. Now, hopefully this stuff is going to be changing through some of the legislation, mm -hmm. uh, but nobody helped him. And um, in the end, uh, I've had so many problems with the freeholder. He came to me and he said, look, I'm having problems with the freeholder. I said to him, don't pay the ground rent. And I told him what to do, you know, just send it back and say until it's actually uh, issued correctly. Um, but he does want to actually sell within the next year. And he's in a real awful situation. So we decided to go for enfranchisement. And um, so we didn't do it ourselves because that's really complicated to do that. Um, we actually went out and we got a surveyor who actually is an expert in doing that on our behalf for us. And we had to go down the statutory route um, because this guy was not going to play ball. It's ended up costing us between us for this, for this Victorian um, house, conversion house, £31,000 plus all of the costs, all the legal costs on the landlord sides um, and the surveyor's costs on the landlord side. So probably we're not going to get much change out of about £36,000. My flat is only valued at around 180, Ian's flat's around 150. So it's a lot of money. So, you know, uh, uh, air on caution here. If your years are going down, then start speaking to the experts and think about it because it is a worry. Um, and it can be a really, really expensive thing. That was on a cheap flat. Mm -hmm. You imagine yeah. how much it, I mean, how much are you? Well, you know? I mean, I think it depends where the property is. I mean, yeah, we don't exactly. really want to get into a discussion on valuation because that's a whole different topic yeah. and it's a, it's a mm. piece of science in its own right. Mm. If I might just come back in on something that you touched on a minute ago, Bernie, about the management of property and will freeholders still have an incentive to own them? Mm. I think there will still be an incentive for certain types of freeholder because if the freeholder has the right to place the insurance, for instance, they'll benefit from the insurance commission, don't forget. Mm. So if you own a large portfolio and you're placing a lot of insurance on a regular basis, you're actually earning out of that. Some of the bigger estates, the central London estates, have their own captive insurer okay. because they're that big as a commercial undertaking. Now, obviously, the average developer doesn't have such economic firepower, but the chances are that there are people interested in retaining some aspects of that. You also touched on another thing, which is to do with management and control of a property. Now, that's where everyone's value is locked in. And in, in Commonhold, for instance, people might think it's brilliant because you get rid of the freeholder, the bad guy has gone. But you replace the bad guy with everyone else in the building in a company together. Now, that may or may not be good. That is heaven or hell, depending on how good the people are at running that company. Yeah. So in other jurisdictions, and we talked a little bit about people, you know, there are other jurisdictions that have leasehold, but other parts <coughs> of the common law world, so Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, for instance, they have things called strata title, which are similar to common hold. Now, it would be wrong to say that that's the answer to all of these problems. It's not as if there's some magic panacea that means people won't ever argue with each other. And in fact, one of the things that they've seen happen is that managing agents, so Maxine, particularly your profession, have come to the fore and people have wanted to see those managers on the boards of these companies because it's only by having somebody who knows what they're doing that you get proper value back out of the property. Mm -hmm. If people want to run it for cheap and run it into the ground, well then, of course, on one level, maybe you don't care. But if you're trying to protect capital value or long-term value, you need appropriate management. And some of these decisions that need to be taken are quite big decisions. So, you know, be careful what you wish for in that regard, I think is one thing. If you're in an RMC that wants to buy its freehold, that's great. Do it. 
I would normally say appoint a managing agent, and I'm not a managing agent, but I've seen so many situations where unless there's more than sort of two flats in a block, it's gone horribly <coughs> wrong. Because of the consultation regime relating to service charges in residential property, if you get that wrong, you can't get your money back. And there's nothing to say there won't be some awkward squad, squad member out there that doesn't want to pay and will use the legislation as a stick to beat you if you're pushing. Um, so be, yeah, be very careful. And finally, the other thing is that um, there are... Oh, you're right. There are, there, are, there are plenty of lenders out there where um, there's a management company written into the lease itself, what I call a third party management company. So ABC Block Management Company is a party to that lease. Now, if that's your company, that's great. If you've got a share in that, it's like having a built in right to manage. It's, you know, closer to heaven than hell, I suppose. Um, but there are plenty of leases out there where other management companies, perhaps owned by developers as captive instruments, have been written into those leases deliberately because then they can manage the block, they can collect the service charge, they can charge the management fees, they can charge a premium for the management service. So another thing to think about as an investor when looking to buy a leasehold property is, well, who is the freeholder? And if there's one of these companies, am I getting a share in that or not? Because if I'm not getting a share in it, and the company is Exco, well-known manager that's not got a fantastic reputation, and I won't name any names here, um, then you might have an issue because you, <coughs> you have an unhappy situation. Now there is a way around that. In the same way you can buy the freehold, there's something you can do called the right to manage. You have a right on a no-fault basis to act collectively and take over the management of your building. But it needs 50% or more of the long leasehold owners to club together to do that. So you have to have 50% or more on board. And it's a complicated process, a bit like buying the freehold. It's something else the government's looking at, trying to make easier. But in theory, it's a fairly straightforward process. And if you do that, you will end up taking over the management. You can remove the management functions of that written-in management company. So again, if that's a problem, there is a solution, but it has to be deployed appropriately. So mm -hmm. there we are. Look, it's interesting, though. I mean, look, on right to manage, then you're kind of almost like a, a, a man of no straw, aren't you? Because you are taking on all the responsibility of the landlords. You're taking over everything, but for nothing. You know, you, you're actually sometimes, as you say, be careful what you wish for yeah. on that. Yeah. Well, I think you've got control of the landlord covenants. Don't, don't, yeah. That's yeah. worth having. The right to manage is worth having because it means you can grant consents under the leases. Not any old consent. There are some consents you'd need the freeholders' involvement for. Mm -hmm. But the day-to-day -day things uh, to do with running the property, they, they fall back into your hands. So the right to manage should not be ignored as a potential group remedy. Yeah, good help. Uh, in the same way with freehold. Once again, it's a collective action, though. You can't do it on your own. There's no individual right to take over the management. Mm -hmm. Strangely enough, it has to be a, 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 a collective yeah, and I, action. And I would say from experience that um, mm -hmm. you do need to have professional advice on that and a managing agent, etc. A lot of leaseholders go down the right to manage route in, in order to reduce cost. And if you reduce cost on a year on year basis, eventually you end up with a complete dump and a mess. And I see so many right to manage companies that, that really have hit the buffers, you know. So if you're going to do right to manage, then do it properly. Don't go for cheap, do, do it properly. Get cost efficiency, spend your money on the right things, but do what you gotta do. Otherwise you will just, I mean, if you think of the, the cost of your service charge year on year, compared to the value of the flat, why scrimp and save a few pennies over here it's going to cost you thousands in the capital value. So be careful about right to manage and do it properly. Um, taking over the management, one of the other things that we've seen, um, it's not quite leasehold reform, but it, it, it um, is a very much a leasehold <coughs> issue. We've seen cladding issues and stuff in recent years following Grenfell, um, and hundreds of thousands of leaseholders um, in awkward positions with high service charges and unable to sell their flats, etc. Um, and we know that the government is very slowly helping with that situation and um, making the developers pay. But I think the thing that isn't being talked about, perhaps we could talk about it a little bit, is building safety bill that is coming down that's, that also has flowed from Grenfell um, which deals with the, all sorts of building safety, not just cladding. Um, compartmentation, I always have to be very careful saying that, I, I find it very <laughs> difficult, which is where a fire is meant to be contained within a flat or within a space. And you'll find if you go and have a look at your flats uh, when you get home tonight, 
you will see there are holes drilled through where pipes go through and wires go through and soil pipes go up the building etc um, and a fire in many many flats will not stay there that is going to be a very very expensive um, exercise for leaseholders over the next five to ten years or so are, are you starting to see that already <laughs> um, not, not really so much in, in in the stock that we're actually uh, managing because fortunately we don't we, we're not managing any anything that came into like you know cladding issues that yeah. uh, but yes i totally agree with you it's um this, and it depends on the age because it comes down to the uh, 1991 Act where the fire safety changed. So if your building's older than that, then it's not actually uh, particularly well built. They used to call it poorly converted or, or mm. poorly built. Um, they changed the name, I can't remember what the name is. But then after 1991, then the fire safety bill changed for purpose built bo blocks of flats. So it was actually a much better um, way of building problem that we've got though Bernie as we know is that it's the government bring in this type of legislation and it's good at that time because that's what it's actually brought in but with Grenfell that was the correct thing at the time the, the, stay, the, the stay safe you know stay put, stay put. policy mm. that should have never been in that building because it was a 70s building and it really wasn't fit for purpose and you're absolutely right as soon as you start carving up the building and you start putting in you know pipes going up walls and you're putting in heating and other things then you're actually that you're you're damaging the integrity of the building so it really is a huge problem and the building safety bill is going to start costing people a lot of money because then when you've got people checking on your buildings and seeing the work that needs to be done who's the bill going to come to it's going to come to every one of you guys as you as the lessees and then who's going to oversee it I mean, there was a, a one point in this build, is this new um, fire safety bill, where they were talking about every block would need to have a an independent person that you'd have to pay for at your service charges. Um, now that was Dame Hackett, Hackett was it? Yeah, yeah. Judith, uh, Hackett. Judith Hackett. Now that's actually been pulled out. Now thank the Lord for that, because can you imagine how much money that an oh. a specialist person in a small block of flats you know in a an area not maybe central london where the 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 rates are uh, you know you're over a million each flat but you know somewhere down in burnley for instance and you know you've got uh, properties that are worth maybe 50 60 thousand pounds still um and you know bringing in a, a specialist to be able to do that so there, there's all sorts of problems i think that we've, we've we've got and they're still being looked at by lord greenham and, and that group um on the building safety bill and how is it going to work and who is going to pay mm -hmm. ultimately it's going to be down to the lessees yeah yeah i think Have you that's seen all, any of that yeah well i think yeah i mean so we, we obviously in the enfranchisement world particularly people are very cautious about buying their free or if their <coughs> building's got cladding on it and rightly mm -hmm. so because the law or the position of this is is not clear where we were maybe two and a half, three years ago, and I did a conference on this uh, to try and find out whether people were interested in, in, in buying freeholds in that situation. So people were unclear about the idea that perhaps they would say, well, we'll take this on, we'll sort it out ourselves, it's going to cost us a lot of money, we'd rather be in control of that budget. Now, of course, if your building's more than 18 metres high, there's the government fund now for that. Mm. We've got similar provision for people with buildings more than 11 metres high. But as things go have gone on and the political will around this has shifted, actually government's now putting in place remedial measures that mean that in certain circumstances leaseholders won't have to pay and they're going to try and go after the developers. So this is an evolving situation and that's a big problem because you might, if people are very committed to contracts and decide to do this themselves, they probably won't be able to access that funding. So it's, it's very much a live political issue. You mentioned the building safety manager, which on one level is a good idea, but I think was seen as being imposing a, a much higher level of cost. And literally mm -hmm. only, I think, two days ago, that amendment was made to the Act at the minute that's going through the Parliament. Yeah. Uh, so that, the building safety manager has been removed. So we're very much on shifting sands here. We don't quite know where that is going to go. The other thing you, you met Maxine touched on, there are two things, because there's the Building Safety Act, it's a very big piece of legislation to do with the, what you might call the immediate impact of Grenfell, or the tragedy that was Grenfell, and is Grenfell. And then you've also got the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order, which looks at you know, more routine things within buildings. So you've got things like, at the moment, for instance, things that are not under the control of the landlord, like the doors, for instance, of their demise to the flat owner. But yet you need to take control of those for a fire safety point of view, because you need to upgrade the fire safety in the building. Mm. 
trying to make provision for some of those more sensible things and, and as you touched on Bernie things like wires pipes conduits cables going between flats there's some nitty gritty stuff that needs to be sorted out to make sure that buildings are safe and this is something which is being looked at but you know mm. it's, a, it's an evolving situation. It is and yeah. um, I think the only thing we know about that is it's going to be costly for, for leaseholders yeah. across the board. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that's on the agenda is for all of us irrespective of leasehold or not is net zero and your carbon footprint and cutting down on fuel costs and uh, increasing insulation and stuff like that. And that's a particular problem in the leasehold world because, um, I mean, how many buy-to-let landlords are there here who've got flats? Quite a few of you. Now, if you've got EPC concerns and you need to increase the insulation of your flat, probably some of the work that needs to be done is outside your control. You know, you may not control the windows. You may not, probably don't control the loft, etc., etc. So it is is a problem. Um, are, are you seeing any of this at the minute? With because you do some letting stuff as well, don't you? So I do. It, yeah. I mean, it's, it's um, it, it worries the life out of me. I'll be honest with you. This minimum energy efficiency standards. The, the date that we keep hearing is 2025. Every property is going to have to move from an E, which is the, the, the lowest you can have at the moment, <coughs> up to a C. Now, that's fine in principle with the government saying that, but in many cases it's actually not possible. Um, and certainly in older Victorian properties, like the one you know where I've just um, buying the, uh, the enfranchisement, um, we couldn't do that with it. It's a solid wall building. It was built in the 18th century. Um, and it, it's not grade two listed or conservation or anything, but it would be so, so expensive. Um, in my own house, for instance, um, I, I moved into a house eight years ago and it's a semi-detached cottage. It was built in 1911. We moved out of it and we literally ripped it all apart. We put in, um, underfloor heating downstairs we moved the stairs we put in so much kingspan really really thick kingspan across all of the walls um, we put solar panels onto the roof um, we've got a log burning central heating system i mean we are so green you just wouldn't believe it and we moved that property to a d and and, and i couldn't believe it because we spent so much mm. money on doing all this work and my EPC, the little card where it gives all the recommendations, it said to, in order to be able to move my property up further, I would need to put a windmill in my back garden. <laughs> so, and I'm not going to be putting a windmill in. Um, so it's really cost prohibitive. And in actual fact, I've got a friend who's um, she, she's a, a, a scientist on this stuff. And she's actually worked it out the cost, the average cost, if you're doing it properly and you are talking about older buildings like that, it's not going to be anything like the five or ten thousand pounds that the government are saying, but it's more likely to be in the region of seventy thousand yeah. pounds. And so, you know, this is going to be absolutely ludicrous. The only way, and I did train as a domestic energy assessor back in 2009. I don't know why, because I never did it. I think it's probably because I'm a landlord trainer, so it was uh, really useful to know and used to, to know how it works. But the only way that this can actually be changed is if they change the algorithms. Um, it's too much assumptions that are being actually done by the energy assessor, and not because they're just assuming, it's because that's the only way they can do it. They cannot go drilling holes through the walls to find out how much, or, or if you've even got any kinds of like insulation between walls. They can't go drilling in your floors. The only thing that they can do is look in your loft space. And, and unless you've actually got all your proof and evidence and all your photos and everything else, and I actually mm. used all those, mm. and I was able to show the man and I still couldn't move my property out of a D, um, you are not going to be able to change it. So it's going to be a huge problem, uh, it Bernie. Is. It really is, and, and it worries me. Mm, it's very tricky. I'm conscious of time, and um, <coughs> we wanted to, that lady there, she's taken off her mask, put her hand up about 20 minutes ago, so you can go first. Yeah. Um, of, of the land that we built on. 
Well, I think the general flow, and we started with the Ground Rent Acts, um, the general flow is to get rid of wicked landlords. Every landlord is a wicked landlord, apparently, and they've got to go. They don't do any work. They just take the money and and fat cats. Um, We're going gradually, I think, to resident control of (coughs) whatever ilk. That will either be leasehold (coughs) resident controlled or commonhold resident controlled so that those that pay for the running of the building will say what needs to be done etc that's the way we'll end up uh, yeah yes. similar but different I think it's yeah, yeah. probably more time will be taken to answer that question than we have here probably but in broad terms yes, yes. although actually the norm that you'll probably see much more of because there have been historically lots of leasehold flats will be 999 year leases at zero mm. rent because you bought the freehold extended the lease to no, uh, with no rent and you own a share in the company that owns the freehold and actually for legal reasons that's actually a safer structure than a common hold at the moment although if common hold is fixed that could be an equivalent structure so that will be the norm and I don't think you know people talk about freehold flats that's what they mean they mean a, a flat on a long lease a 999 year lease and a share in the company that owns the freehold mm-hmm. and that will become the norm for most previous converted properties you know assuming people go forward and buy their freeholds in due course yeah, which I think they will yeah. yes sir If they're not barking mad, yeah. Um, and I've got several places where the leases are getting a little bit what I call shaky. Um, but I think certain freeholders are wising up to the fact that perhaps they should maybe take an offer from the leases. It, it's always worth talking to your freeholder. There's no harm in asking. If you don't ask, you don't get. So you might as well ask and see what happens. You, you deal with a lot of freeholders, don't you? And presumably some of the bigger ones as well. Are they um, I think changing that, I their think, views? No, I think most freeholders are reasonably robust at the moment because the law hasn't changed yet. And it's not clear as and when it will. I mean, you know, who knows what's going to come up and distract the government next? You know, we, we have the dreadful situation in the Ukraine at the moment. That wasn't on the agenda a month or two ago. And so, you know, if you're taking the medium to long term view, what else could get in the way of changing the law? Um, so I think people pr- they tend to prefer to sit and wait. I mean, some of the smaller pe- portfolio people, depends who you're talking about, really, an individual might get advice and say, look, I'd, I'm happy to release this now because I want to get some money for my pension or whatever it might be. Um, but I think that the bigger institutions at the moment are very much on a sort of stick and hold kind of basis. Because what you've got to think about as well is, you know, we've said lots of things about making it cheaper and easier and reforming the law in favour of leaseholders. But actually, if you happen to own a flat where a ground rent's being paid and no more ground rent can be granted on all the other freeholds, then are we not going to see a situation in which those freeholds became, become more valuable? Because they've got an income stream. And let's face it, ground rent is very good from an investment point of view. You're all investors in property, you understand that. A rock-solid, bomb-proof income where someone's paying you a fixed sum of money every year, regardless of whatever happens, is good news. So, you know, some of the very big institutions invest in ground rent, they're not very keen to publicise it, but pension funds particularly like it, because it provides a very nice, low, stable income base. Mm. So, yeah, I, you know, case by case, I think is the yeah. answer. I would say try, ask, yeah. Yeah. ask them. Ask. You, if you don't ask, you don't get, so yeah. ask. Yeah, go and ask. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a really good point. Uh, no, that's a very good point, actually. So, gentlemen's just raised that. Mm-hmm. So, just to reiterate it so everyone can hear. Um, so, at the minute, if you want to buy your freehold in a building, you need 50% of the flat owners to club together. You also need a building that qualifies, which means that two thirds of the buildings let out on long leases and not more than 25% is being used for non residential purposes. Now, there's a discussion in the Law Commission paper on this about raising the threshold to 50% so that 50% of the building could be non-residential and you'd still qualify, and changing the same threshold for right to manage. Because, of course, if government's objective was to make it cheaper and easier and give people more access to those rights, then why not change the law on that basis? So the government very recently consulted on that. Actually, back in February, they consulted uh, with various industry bodies about what people thought about changing the threshold, because the Law Commission themselves said, actually, no, we suggest you just keep it at 25%. But government, being government, and wanting to deliver this good news for leaseholders, it said, well, what about if we did shift it towards 50%? So there's consultation, but consultation only. 
and you could perhaps read into that that maybe uh, MHCLG or DLUHC as they are now um, yeah, will decide that this is something they want to see in a future programme of legislative reform but it's not happening now a bit like the much vaunted 990 year lease extension which was on the front page I think of the Telegraph when it came out you know, two years ago oh yeah you're not going to be able to get lease extension that length of time that's the idea but that idea is nowhere near any statute book anytime soon mm -hmm. so you know it, but this one it's something government are thinking about mm -hmm. developers yeah. and, 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 and you know large property portfolios that own commercial space won't be very happy with this for lots of reasons one of which would be do they want to get in a sandwich with 50% of the leaseholders in the management of that building. But mm. We'll have one, we're out of time, but we'll have one last one. Yes, oh, sir. I'll wait the men at the front as well. I appreciate the changes in marriage though, in mm. some way, of the statute. What's your opinion of the direction of government? What form of those changes will take? So I think the question is, what is the prospect of the law changing in relation to marriage value? Well, that was mentioned mm. in the um, MHCLG statement on 7th of January 2021. Mm. Um, well, you, you know, look at the time scale earlier on. The government said it would do something about ground rent. It took five years. So is that a similar timeline? That's an easy answer to give you. Um, how could you change? How could you make that change? You'd have to amend the existing <coughs> legislation. You also end up in a very difficult position because what happens is you've got to carry out some kind of balancing exercise. Because if you suddenly just come along and chop away the rights of freeholders significantly and reduce the value of their assets, well, then they may well have a claim under Article 1, Protocol 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So any reform has to carry out some kind of balancing act between those two interests. And so what government takes with one hand, it may have to give back with the other. And one of the other discussions that's happened recently is, well, if you, if you know about the calculations, you'll know that there's another thing called the deferment rate. Now, the deferment rate arguably is uh, too, um, too high, or too, it, it, because lowering the interest rate increases the amount of compensation the freeholder gets, because reference to other market values of things like the bond market would suggest that the interest rates should be much lower. Uh, so what could potentially happen is you could see marriage value being abolished or reduced and then other parts of the calculation like the capitalisation rate or the deferment rate being adjusted to produce some kind of um, you know, other compensation to the freeholder. So it might not just be a question of saying, oh, that's it, marriage value's gone, it's automatically been chopped in half. You know, colloquially, maybe marriage value might be as much as a third of the lease extension premium on an, on an average case, whatever that is. Um, so, yes, I mean... No easy answer. Timeline, not certain. Depends on how it falls. And don't forget, political questions as well must be debated by Parliament in order to get to an answer. So, there we are. Mm. We've not got people rushing in, so we'll carry on. Fine. Um, we sell properties to the Turkish people. I'm British Turkish. And the, the very first, or the definite question I'm always getting is, we don't definitely want a leasehold because it's very alien. And apparently the Queen owns the thing, we still, we're just tenants. So, but what I have to keep telling them, it's very romantic, it's very nice. Um, <laughs> yeah, but um, what I tell to them is, and I, I understand, I, I mean, I just want a clarification a bit on that, but if you're actually an overseas owner of property, you would actually wish it to be leasehold so that you don't have to deal with it, right? If you have a problem like Glenfell, for example, and need to do something about the cladding or the actual uh, structure of the, the building, how are you going to... That's, yeah, but that's not right, though, is it? Because if you own it, under, providing the lease is not defective, you're down to pay a service charge. So if the building needs new cladding, you're getting a massive bill anyway. Mm -hmm. So the question is, are you getting a vote in that or not, really? If you've got no interest in the freehold, if you don't have a share in a freehold company, for instance, then you've got no, no vote in, in the body that takes those decisions. But actually, the cost is still there. It's not about the cost, but making the right decision. I mean, I, oh, I see, making decisions yourself. I mean, how are you going to manage that process well, of, you know, actually uh, tendering it and mm -hmm. then assessing? Well, that's for the, the manager. That's for the property that's, manager. Yeah. yeah, that's where property managers, managing agents come in, and I would always advise um, that there should be a professional managing agent because it is a very complicated mm -hmm. um, area. Um, there's a lot of chatter out there on Facebook and Twitter, etc., about again in addition to freeholders just being total bastards managing agents are as well all they do is fleece the leaseholders etc you know i get trolls telling me that every day of the week um but it there is a job to be done it is a complicated series of god knows how many acts of parliament and it's ever changing and you've got to herd the cats and get the consensus and and then get them to pay for it so it's very difficult i would i would say um being a managing agent is no fun. Um, 
a lot of the managing agents, in fact, all, I would say almost all managing agents, are wanting regulation to come along, regulation of property agents. And again, that is something that's been talked about for years, um, not just with managing agents, but with estate agents, letting agents, surveyors, etc., getting them licensed, etc. Um, I mean, do you, do you, you're nodding your head there first. Do well, you I think, think that's been, a damn good you know, idea? Well, it's been talked about. I mean, I think I was interviewed about it about seven or eight years ago, maybe longer, 10 mm. or 12 years ago. Yeah. Um, I know, you know, we're, we're not in the property management sector ourselves, but people like Armour have been very vocal about setting up a voluntary scheme of regulation for managing agents. They've tried to encourage government to take that on. Mm. Um, it's something that, that I think should be encouraged. At the end of the day, at the moment, and no disrespect to either of the property managers sitting next to me here, who are completely honest, incredible people, no doubt, but anyone can set themselves up as a property manager, yeah. and they're responsible for millions and millions of pounds worth of leaseholders' money. Absolutely. OK, it's held on statutory trust under the 1987 Act, but really, mm. your budget, your enormous service charge budget, has been run by anybody. Yeah. Now, the truth is you can't run an oper operation of some significance without a degree of education and training, but the voluntary bodies, so the likes of Armour, the likes of the R IRPM, who've put on excellent ad training, and in fact those two bodies have just recently come together to try and promote excellent practice within the industry, are setting the gold standard. Um, so I think one question you would ask as an investor is, you know, not only who is the freeholder, but who is the managing agent and what is the property, what's the property management like? Because that's the thing that's going to come back and hit you in the pocket, the cost of the service charge. Yeah. And don't think necessarily that expensive is bad, but it's quality of service that's really, what's up, really what you're up against, really. Because if the quality of service is no good, you're looking at long-term capital degradation. Mm. Anything you want to add on that before uh, we round yeah, up? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, um, regulation couldn't come soon enough. Um, we've got so many people that can go into this industry and they think that they can do it. And there is so much that you have to learn. And it's not only that, it's the managing agent. The managing agent is 100% responsible. So they're responsible for the building, they're responsible for the health and safety, they're responsible for the budgets, they're responsible for everything. So you have recourse, you have somebody that you can go to. Um, so if your agent is a regulated agent, then they will have the insurances in place. But if you go to an agent because you've bought on price, like you've gone for the cheapest one, then you might well find an agent that's unregulated, hasn't got any insurance in place, makes a terrible job of it, and could end up getting you in a lot of trouble. So I would say pick your agents very carefully, interview your agents, make sure that they're going to do the job properly, um, because that is it's your asset, it's your building, and you've got to make sure that whoever's looking after your building is looking after it as they should do, um, and making sure that you're getting good value as well. well great, thanks. Now we are definitely out of time, There's so one I, lady I, there, she's I, just I would desperate. Quick. Uh, so, what can the leaseholders do uh, if the managing agent doesn't do the work? You can get rid of them. <laughs> Right, well, it's that, that's a, how long's a piece of string on that one. As far as what can you do, it all depends on the way your lease is set up. So the first thing that you need to do, and he hasn't said it today, but he normally, his, his mm, catch line right, is sure. read the bloody lease. So, um, so the first thing you need to do is to check the lease, make sure that the lease is actually, um, that you can change the agent. If you are an RMC company... Yeah, there is no agent mentioned. So it's probably a landlord it could that be a owns landlord it. Yeah. 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 If you go on my website, there's a free download yeah. download about how to change the man how to fire your freeholder and the managing agent. So have a look at BurneyWales.co.uk and get the free download about it. Um, we are definitely out of time. time so if you've <laughs> got more questions, then Google us. We got. Yeah. I'd like to thank Mark Chick. Thank you, Bernie. Maxine Fothergill. Thank I'm Bernie you. Wells. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.